we have a special program. I will introduce him. I'm just going to tell you that he's a public speaker, and he's, he's been around the world speaking, and he's been a source of help to, I'll just give you some ideas, to GE, Microsoft, Medtronic, Johnson Controls, NSA, National Science, FBI, and used U.S. Department of Treasury, and the U.S. Secret Service. So he's got lots of talents. He's got a lot of things to tell us about. So let's give Richard T.D. a Kiwanis welcome. Thank you very much. That does sound like the National Science Foundation, but it's actually the National Security Agency, uh, the NSA. Uh, done some uh, work with them from time to time, and that's relevant to what I'm going to be talking about. The title is uh, Hackers, Crackers, and Spies. And that's chosen because there are so many people interested in what's going on every time your phone rings and it's not somebody you know, every time you get an email and it says click here, and if you do, you're in trouble. Uh, your computer may be taken over and locked down unless you pay to have it released. Uh, or you may be visiting a website that drops what we call malware, which is simply software designed to do what they want it to do, not what you want it to do on your computer. And that can include uh, surveillance in every possible way by logging every one of your keystrokes or by turning on your microphone and, uh, and listening in to everything that goes on within reach of your computer uh, and doing the same with your camera. Uh, so we have invented this monster and, and now we have to live with it. It's kind of like, I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones, but it's kind of like learning to live with a dragon. Uh, when they work for you, they're great, and when they don't, they're terrible trouble. So how did we get here? Uh, what, what is a hacker? What is a cracker? And how does that relate to spies, to intelligence, and to espionage? I think it's a good idea to go back to where all this began, because it'll give you an idea of how we, how we got here. Uh, the Internet emerged in the 1960s. It was a program of what was then called ARPA. Uh, advanced research projects uh, of the military of the United States, and uh, now it's DARPA, defense attacks. Uh, every company, every country that has an offensive capability calls it the Department of Defense because that's better marketing. Uh, but it's the Department of Offense as well. And they discovered that it wasn't that difficult because we had a few geniuses come up with the protocols that made it not that difficult to take computers, which at that time were very big and cumbersome, and have them connect to each other and exchange data that way. So the network really didn't exist yet. It was invented. And uh, that's one of the things that happens with connectivity. Uh, and, and, and so until 1993, it was illegal to do any commercial activity on the Internet. It was invented by and for uh, three major entities, corporations, uh, the military, and academia. So the only way you could get on the computers, if you wanted to, uh, was through one of those avenues. Uh, we didn't have home computers in any significant number, and if we did, we couldn't use them to access these great big mainframes. You may remember that you'd have computers in areas the size of this room, uh, surrounded by glass with uh, air, air cooling and uh, scientists in white jackets that looked like Dr. Kildare, uh, tending these things like, like great high priests of new technology, and indeed they were. And those who said at that time, literally, or in the 50s before then, what we're going to do is connect these computers to each other, and they're going to exchange data with each other. A uh, famous guy at that time, J.C.R. Linklater, a uh, brilliant man, said that's what we're going to do, and he was dressing scientists and brilliant people, and those who were sitting in the back of the room were going, like, shoveling, yeah, right, <clears throat> because it was literally unthinkable to take these huge mainframes and somehow cable them together in a meaningful way. Well, that's not, as you know, uh, what came came to be. So because it was built for these people who knew each other, who worked together, and above all trusted one another, the network was designed 
for trust. It was designed for trusted people to use it, and it was designed, therefore, for ease of access. In other words, let's make it as easy as possible to sit at a computer or operate a computer and communicate with others over this fledgling, fledgling network, trust and ease of access. Those were the hallmarks of the internet, and it was designed to be that way. And that's the origin, kind of like the Big Bang, of a lot of our troubles. Because the platform on which the internet is based continues to be a platform designed for trusted participants and ease of access. Uh, <clears throat> now, we're having to overlay on that the fact that so many of the people using it can't be trusted and also to make it more and more difficult to access unless you know, for example, passwords or some other means of getting to your account. Uh, so that's where all the, all the trouble started. So who were hackers in those days? Well, young people at schools began to study computer science and they got excited, as young people will. Uh, some of you remember how excited we used to get when our hormones were in great supply, and the adrenaline was rushing, and we didn't need as much sleep, and we were very excitable. I know that when I hit middle age, I remember saying to my wife, you know, I'm really getting some real self-control here. And the doctor said to me, no, that's just your testosterone going down. <laughs> uh, so morality and chemistry continue to overlap. Uh, but these kids got excited, and they wanted to play in this space because it was so inviting. You sit at a computer, and what, one of the things that's very inviting about it is it's a symbol-manipulating machine. Well, uh, so, is, so is this. This is a book. And the reason I can hold up a book and the reason you can read it silently to yourselves it's about four or five hundred years old. 1450s is when Gutenberg invented the printing press with movable type. And then books became much more accessible, and it created the whole scientific revolution because standardized knowledge from one place to another could now be shared, and you could pretty much be sure it was reliable. It was like on a computer, you do a checksum to make sure the data sent is the data you want it to be. So uh, this is a symbol manipulating machine. These words are symbols. And the way we operate the machine is very elegantly simple. It has a cover and a title, and you open it. And then when you finish one page, you turn the page. And then you turn another page. Symbol manipulating machine. Well, sitting in a computer, you're engaging with a symbol manipulating machine, but it's having a profoundly different impact on you. It's addictive, it's compelling, it's inviting, and it rewards you because it has a malleability of symbolic knowledge that the book doesn't have. Once that book is printed, that book is printed. But once you put data into a computer, it's malleable, and the binary structure of computer code means that you can model anything that exists on the computer anything. And it's that malleability, that elasticity that is so compelling. Well, a kid sitting down at a big mainframe and learning to do code in those first computer languages and learning that he could communicate with other computers and have fun and invent games and above all do pranks, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that was impossible to resist. But because you could only get on the computer for most young college students after school, uh, the only way to get on that network was to hack into it. Uh, it was very, very expensive. You couldn't avoid, uh, afford a Spark workstation uh, as a student. Uh, you didn't have $50,000 in 1988 money lying around. Um, and uh, the internet was not available anywhere else. Now, you flash forward 10 years and go to a hacker con, and now it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You can buy boxes and boxes and boxes. You can buy megabytes and teraflops of storage. 
you can use the cloud and keep as much data as you want. Pretty soon it got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and more and more and more available, and the internet was ubiquitous and available everywhere. But at the start it wasn't, so the only way you could get on was to hack. So the kids who were most proficient at that, and they were kids in the main, uh, did it because they, had, they were creative, they were intelligent, they were of a particular bent, they were usually very innovative, and what they discovered in that malleable space was that they could make it do all kinds of things that it had not been invented to do. And that's what the malleability made available. Uh, you can't make that book change its print, but you can enter a computer and alter what it is that it's doing in a way that the original programmers creating the data on the computer did not foresee. <clears throat> and that's what hacking was. It was very, very exciting to play in that space for these young guys. Um, and you kind of ignored the fact that it might not have been strictly kosher. It wasn't legal yet, or illegal, because no laws had been written about computers and how they were used and how you access them. That had just never, uh, never come up yet. Uh, one of the reasons, thank you. One of the <coughs> reasons, I, I think you mentioned that I spoke for the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and that was for the senior lawyers at Treasury at the end of the Clinton administration to talk about why precedent was being totally subverted, undermined by this new technology and a lot of the applications of case law from the past were not going to apply in the future and that's exactly what's happened. Uh, my job was to see the future, but I did it by looking at the present and looking at the technologies and ask how did they shape and form the relationships and the activities the behaviors of people that were going to come. Because we're what I called 25 years ago, real birds in digital cages. You mistake the simulated environment of a computer for reality, you enter into it, it captures you in a cage, and as long as you have enough room to flap your wings and have the illusion of freedom of flight, you're content thinking you're flying, but the cage is moving, and all the recent political activity using the internet and social media is just one more instantiation of how that works, how propaganda, counterintelligence, and the like has been elevated to a new level of sophistication and effectiveness because of worldwide connectivity. Okay, so these kids, these kids were playing, and this is something a friend of mine, Hacker, said, uh, for the system to work, he said, quotes around work, and by system he meant the whole, the whole system, he said, it must never grow up and it should make us smile. That's the way hackers thought about it. It should be fun, it should be an opportunity for creativity and innovation, and we should be able to make this incredibly potent, powerful medium do what we want, rather than what the hardware and software manufacturers intended it to do. That's what a hacker is. You took things apart in order to see how they fit, and if you understood them, you could then put them back together in a slightly different configuration and make that machinery do something other than what it was intended to do. Well, the fact that this was happening meant education as well as business and government. Uh, we haven't caught up yet with government um, and how to administer government in this new, new age. Uh, this, this was t taking over the world, really. Uh, if you remember, I guess nobody's here from the late 19th century, right? I mean, we're, we're an older group, but we're not that old. But in the late 19th century, 1890s, uh, what happened is a system of governance designed for an agricultural society where 80% or more Americans had worked had to be totally revamped. And it was a period of chaos and transformation and transition for an industrial society. What we're going through now is that industrial society system of governance is being revamped during a period of chaos and transition for a digital society, an electronically connected society. And that's why everything is seemingly up for grabs, but it's not, it's not up for grabs, but it is going through a major transformational period uh, from what it was to something else. Okay, so these kids, Kids got into the computer, made it do what they wanted, and they called it hacking. And it was fun. 
So I started speaking professionally in 93. That was the first year that you could do something commercially viable on the internet. And uh, I was invited in 1996 to keynote a conference called DEF CON. I don't know if any of you have heard of DEF CON, uh, taken from the DEF CON 54321 system uh, numbers for readiness in the event of nuclear war, all the way down to get the nukes up and going. <coughs> DEF CON was a hacker con that started in Las Vegas. A young man named Jeff Moss had decided that the hundred or so young people who met in what we called bulletin boards, which were four websites. Bulletin boards were standalone units with software designed to make them available, like bulletin boards, for posting pictures and text. He said, why don't we meet in person? And they picked Las Vegas, and about 100 young men, and they were all men, boys, met in Vegas to meet with each other and talk about what they did and share exploits, share how to do it, share their wisdom and expertise. That was 94. Three, four, 93, 94, 95 were the first ones. 1996, DEF CON 4, I was asked that I want to do a keynote for it because he had learned what I did talking about technology and where it was going to take us uh, and the world. And I said, sure. And I did a talk uh, for 375 people at that conference. Well, last summer, I spoke for the 22nd straight year at DEF CON. <coughs> Nobody else has had a run like that. And there were about 25,000 people, not 375. It's grown into, to call it a circus, it's, it's, it's got a million rings, not three rings. Uh, the offshoots and the spin-offs and the things associated with it, and it does it all over the world now. And Jeff, uh, at that conference in 1993, 96, uh, we had a conversation about, you know, you, you young guys, you know a lot of things that the other people, that is intelligence, military, and corporate, need to know. Why don't you put on a conference for them? And the following year, they invented one called the Black Hat Briefings. And I keynoted that for them, and I keynoted the second one. And now, Black Hat Briefings is the go-to place for networking and instructional presentations and conferences for intelligence, for corporate security, and so on. So he built something magnificent. And I was very privileged to be part of it. And by engaging with the young people, as an older person who could provide some kinds of guidance that were not technical, but were existential, that were about values and life and how to understand what it was you were doing with this technology, uh, I became close friends to, uh, to many of them. Uh, they became the most valued relations I've ever had. And also at that first DEF CON, it was clear that I was meeting people from uh, CIA and from NSA. They were there, some of them undercover, but some weren't. And because of my age, which was older, uh, I became close friends with some of them and subsequently worked with some of them on some projects that involved uh, behaviors and, and ethics above all and, and the transformation of intelligence itself. Because what was clear to me is that this computerization was going to change everything. I'm going to read you a quote. This is from a couple of decades ago. Langdon Winter was a brilliant computer scientist and he said, to invent a new technology requires that society also invent the kinds of people who will use it. Older practices, relationships, and ways of defining people's identities fall by the wayside. New practices, new relationships, new identities take root. In case after case, the move to computerize and digitize means that many pre-existing cultural forms have suddenly gone liquid. Beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful term. We thought they were solid. It was like a cube of ice. We thought it was solid. And next thing you know, you've got a puddle of water in your palm, and the water is dripping through your fingers, and then sublimating into the air as a gas. They've suddenly gone liquid, losing their former shape as they are retailored for computerized expression. Well, that's what was happening. And these hackers, I could tell, were in the forefront of the thinkers who were going to build that world and therefore determine, in effect, the framework in which you live and move and think and act. And subsequently, you would not even notice that that was true, that your behaviors would be changed as a result of interacting with the computer networks, and it would become normal. And young people would grow up, I said, who would be socialized to this technology without knowing anything was ever different. 
So one of the offshoots of that fact is privacy and what's happened to privacy. Uh, there is none, in a nutshell. I can explain all the reasons why you can't count on privacy being there for you the way when you grew up you thought you could have privacy. There used to be, you thought, a boundary around you, around your identity, around access to personal information about you. Uh, and now that's not true. The people who take all of the data, which all of us put on the internet all of the time, can mine that data for patterns about us, our identities, and our behaviors, and what we're likely to do in the future to a degree that we ourselves don't know. So the result is that we are known better by others than we know ourselves. Because the pieces of data that we share, you go to a grocery store and you have a customer card, you use a credit card at the gas station, every single transaction in which you engage, telephone calls, as we used to call them, cell phone calls, all of your interactions that are mediated electronically on networks are now capable of being not just united and databased, but mined for understanding because of the relationships between the pieces that you yourself don't see when you put a credit card in a gas pump and then go on your way. You don't know that that means anybody who has access to that data can know you were there and you were there then. And this is what you bought and this is what you went into the store to buy. So this is the kind of drink you like to have. And that's why within 30 seconds, you're going to get an ad popping up on your Facebook account that says Mountain Dew. Uh, and, uh, but it's much more nefarious than that. So what happened to hacking, which started off relatively innocently and not as an illegal activity, grew as the people who do bad things uh, recognize the potential of this extraordinary access to information and therefore to money. Money and power is what it came to be about. So hackers began to include criminals who were more than mischievous. Uh, they became criminal bands. They became criminal networks. And now we have global criminal networks of an extent that is far beyond the average person's ability to grasp and understand. At the same time, the word hacker, because it was used to mean just those miscreants, came more and more to mean what we call a cracker, a criminal hacker. And the young hackers who want to be creative and innovative and play um, still resent the loss of the meaning of the word hacker as it originally came to be at MIT in the 1960s, yeah. which was a mischievous, intelligent way of pranking the world. Uh, so, crackers, criminal networks, obviously are going to attract the attention of law enforcement. But more than that, the intelligence communities, which traffic in information, are going to have to change in the 90s the way they do things. Because information is not a respecter of boundaries. It begins somewhere, goes through a boundary that's now semi-permeable or porous, and it comes out somewhere else. And you cannot always even tell where it began or who it is that's using the information. The result of boundaries becoming porous, I already mentioned that privacy is one casualty because the boundary around your identity is semi-porous. The same thing has happened to nation states. It's happened to countries. In, in other words, we live as if we still live only in a country. Now, we do live in a country, but there have emerged as a result of computerization transnational economic entities that are loyal to themselves only and not to the alleged country of their origin. So if you look at any large corporation like Apple, or uh, Google, or Microsoft, you'll find much more than 50% of their income is from places other than America. We will call it an American company, but it's transnational. And therefore, when it acts on its own self-interest, as all companies do, then it will sometimes contradict 
what people in that old country like to think of as patriotic. I was talking about this with a lead guy at the Chicago FBI office once upon a time, and he said, that explains what we're running into. He said, we used to be able to go to American citizens and say, we need your cooperation on this or that case. And people would say, on the basis of their patriotic feeling, of course, I'll be glad to help you. What I'm hearing more and more, he said, was people are saying, I would like to help you, but, and that but was the proof of the concept I'm just advancing. That but meant the real source of power and influence that affects my behavior is not the country, but something else, some other entity. We call it a transnational because it's beyond and smears all the boundaries of countries. And we've created this world in part through the transmission of information everywhere at the speed of light. So inevitably, the intelligence units of all countries are going to be in what we now call cyber operations. Uh, and that chicken does come home to roost. The, remember I said it started with ease of accessibility and assuming trust. But when the agent operating is in another country and does not have our best interest at heart, and what they find they can access through ease of access is the power grid or the water supply or any other critical infrastructure that is essential to our well-being, then the only thing we can do in response is to make clear to them that if they do anything to us on that scale, we will do the same to them and worse. In other words, it's what we used to call in the nuclear age. Remember nuclear age? Just get nostalgic for just worrying about <coughs> hydrogen bombs and missiles. Uh, mutual assured destruction. So just as they have penetrated our networks to a degree that is more than uncomfortable, so have we penetrated theirs. And this is what intelligence has become. Now, I was working with some people on the ethical issues implied by the changes in their orders after 9-11. Because the changes that I said would happen to law and to countries had happened. And 9-11 made it obvious that if you were going to do the intelligence work that required you to know what others were doing, you had to do it in violation of what had been formulated in the 20th century as the legal requirements of what you could do. And so an executive order went from the Bush White House to the agencies saying, this is what you must now do. And senior personnel in those agencies who had been trained and educated never to do those things because they were illegal and unconstitutional just stood in shocked silence. Because in effect, if you're going to stop everything, you must intercept everything. And if you're going to intercept everything, it means intercepting as well as foreign American communications at all levels. And that began to be done, as you would probably know if you uh, follow the news and the issues. People are trying to stop it from being done, but in order to do intelligence properly, at the scale we want to do it, we have to do it. And that means bigger and bigger and bigger facilities. The National Security Agency is building a, has built uh, in uh, Bluffdale, Utah, south of Salt Lake City, a facility so large and requires so much energy for the massive amount of computing power in that facility that it had to choose somewhere other than Maryland where its headquarters is because the state of Maryland could not generate the power sufficiently for them to manage and sustain uh, that, that entity. So I was working with some people there on reflecting on ethical issues in light of those profound changes. And one of them, an assistant deputy director, said, you know, of course, you can't ever discuss what we talk about with you. And he paused. He said, unless you start writing fiction. He said, fiction is now the only way you can tell the truth. Well, I've published 35 short stories since then. 19 of them were collected in this volume called Mind Games uh, in 2010. 
and I published a novel a couple years ago called Foam, which you can take a look at in three, three versions here. And this great big book is a side effect. This is totally nonfiction, but it will read to you like fiction. It's called UFOs in Government, a Historical Inquiry. Because for 40 years, working these edges of our lives, I discovered that UFO phenomena was real 40 years ago, and I wanted to know what it was. And I wanted to know why it was managed the way it was. So over the 40 years, I'll simply make it very brief, I've escalated my engagement with the best minds exploring that until I was asked a few years ago to participate in a team of 10 or 12 people that created this book, UFOs in Government, A Historical Inquiry, and in this book, we document how the government responded to the phenomena from the 1940s to the 1980s. There are nearly 1,000 footnotes in this book, and take a look at it. Every single one goes to a government document or other primary source. And that's why the book was recommended by the journal Choice, which does such things, for every single university library in the country. It is the gold standard in bulletproof data used to create a meaningful, plausible, historical narrative, not detailing what the phenomena is about, but detailing why the government began to respond in the 1950s to it the way that they did. So we're very proud of that book, and I'm doing a talk at uh, OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, for four week. I did a talk, and it worked so well that they wanted a class, so I'm doing a four week class based on the book. The first one was last Friday, the second one is, is tomorrow. Here? It's in YZ. Yeah, okay. It's an uh, organization called Folkstone. Big, beautiful place with a good auditorium. Uh, but you can look at, uh, I have business cards here, and you can look at the website or go to YouTube and put my name in, and you'll find the first talk I did for DEF CON on the book uh, a few years ago. And they're all on YouTube. Uh, just put my name into YouTube in the search engine or put my name into Google, and all this stuff will come out. So, I've already gone over time, so I'm going to pause. Uh, the bottom line is, hacking became cracking. Real hackers still exist, but we have created an entity that has taken us over, kind of like the Borg and uh, Star Trek. Uh, we are now part of a uh, symbiotic relationship with our machinery, and this is only going to <laughs> intensify. Uh, the development of artificial intelligence, we now have what we call weak AI, but it's pretty strong. We don't have strong AI, that is AI that knows what it is and what it needs to do beyond our ability to program it. That's already happening in some ways. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, there was this biological lab and it wanted to run a particular experiment and it didn't have all the inputs but the computer program knew it was supposed to receive a particular kind of input, a particular chemical, in order to factor it into the equations it was running. And what it did is simply explore its environment in the laboratory and discover that that chemical was a byproduct of some subsidiary experiment and incorporated what it learned about that chemical into the and it completed the project for itself in a way that no human being would have been able to anticipate or program it to do. So that's what I mean about the machines are going to become more creative than us, playing games like Go uh, or chess. That's, as it turns out, the low-hanging fruit. But IBM has already created Deep Blue, and, and the machine beat the Go Master, a uh, very complex, subtle game, much faster than they thought it would be done, and it did it by playing games against itself. You remember the movie War Games, uh, which is where all of that began, playing games against itself for nuclear war, and the movie <coughs> War Games became very popular. Well, I met Larry Lasker, who wrote War Games at DEF CON <coughs> back in 1996, because that's where he came to do his research. So we've got a new world. We have literally a world that has not yet figured itself out. Uh, one of the responses to that politically is to say, we want to go back. Can't. Won't. Longing for what was does not recreate what was. It just makes you sad that it no longer exists. 
and the only opportunity we really have is to engage with the technology itself and the people who use it creatively, which is what I chose to do at the age of 49 with these young people. And the first talk I did for them was called Hacking is Practice for Transplanetary Life in the 21st Century. And I looked out at that audience of people who felt like rejects, spiked hair and blue hair and metal everywhere. And I said, you are the thought leaders of the 21st century. You are going to build the framework in which other people unknowingly live their lives. And one of them recently who went on to work for DARPA uh, and then Google uh, said to me recently, he said, some of us knew what you meant. Another one just sold their company for $640 million. They work at CIA, they work at NSA, they work at Apple, they work at their own corporation. <coughs> because I had the age and experience, the teachers look, you know, I could look and see who they were and understand by virtue of the contrast of books with computers, what a monumental revolutionary change was coming. So that's where we are. You engage with the technology, it will show you things. And then you can use them and cooperate with it. Refuse to engage, well, just going to find yourself further and further off the grid. And the language people use around you will sound more and more incomprehensible, as kids describe. It already it. does. Yeah. <laughs> and it changes. We used to say, I'm going on the internet. Well, when I was a kid, my mother would say, shh, I'm going on long distance. <laughs> right? But there is no long distance. There's just no distance. You pick up this computer, which has more computing power than the Apollo 13 moon mission uh, that you carry in your pocket. Um, and you dial any number, you don't dial, you dial is an archaic term, you tap any number in the world and you go there instantaneously. So we don't say long distance and we don't say I'm going on the internet. Kids today are socialized always and everywhere to be in and immersed in the world of the internet, including the internet of things, which creates, I haven't even begun to talk about the security risks and what we're up against as we put our houses, our cars, our, uh, th our uh, thermostats, our refrigerators, refrigerators, TVs, have already been incorporated into massive hacking attacks because people have not secured them and the manufacturers of them prize time to market and immediate prof profitability over security. And security is an afterthought as it has been for the internet from the beginning. And then when you add the fact that our intelligence communities need some of these flaws and exploits to exist, so that, for example, I remember a hacker telling me he was about to make public a flaw in software that was widely used so it could be corrected. And he got a call from one of the agencies saying, don't do that. We like that one. Uh, so it has become indistinguishable, hasn't it? Nation state actors, criminal enterprises, hackers, the technology has made available to all of them at the same time. The same tools and the same techniques, and that's what I said back in 96. I said to these kids looking out, I said, you want to hack? I said, come on in. Come into the agencies. You'll have the best mentors. You'll be taught the best techniques. You'll have the best tools. And above all, you get a get out of jail free card. <laughs> because you get to break the laws of every country in the world on our behalf. And it's okay. And the only thing I've had to add to that is, except now you can break our own laws too. <laughs> and it's okay. So, uh, this is just what's real. It's just what's so. And so our challenge and, uh, is to uh, understand it, to not be afraid of it, to cooperate, to give each other the security we need to keep learning what it means, and to behave in an appropriate way to defend our own self and space and stuff, so that it's not so open to egregious attack. Okay, question. Uh, the question was, why can we not incorporate the computer learning, machine learning, and AI in solving these security problems? And the answer is, of course, we can. The question is whether there's the human will and intention to do so. Uh, we could make it more secure than we are. There would be a cost. I said it was built for ease of access. The more security you add, the less easy is access. 
And people have shown time and time again in the commercial space, you, you guys, us humans, we prefer convenience to security. So you want to sit down on a computer and just do everything? Oh, you need a password. Oh, you need a password that's 14 letters long that has squiggles in it and caps, and, and then you have to remember it. But don't write it down because someone could find it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So suddenly you see even something as simple as passwords, which a lot of people think correctly could be gotten rid of, but they're now built into the software, and there's legacy systems to require them. Um, even that interferes with ease of access and convenience, and people hate them. Well, you can just multiply that by many other instances where security prevents <coughs> people from having what they want, which is to take the phone out and use it. And the fact that somebody may be standing next to you intercepting your call is secondary to you because you don't see it, you don't feel it, you don't know it. You only know the consequences of it if somebody does something mischievous with it. So we could solve some of those problems. We could also go back to basics and reinvent the whole thing because I've worked with the computer scientists who are quite brilliant and who had security protocols built in. And one of the things that's noticed over the decades of working with this stuff is that the same problems, same challenges come up again and again and again because they were built in and they were never fixed. But they had fixes for them way back then and choices were made. Choices were made by military, by government, and by corporate to not include those fixes for a variety of reasons. So it's just like the environment. Could we do a better job of recognizing the scientific truth of what we have done to ourselves and start doing serious things to ameliorate some of the effects over the long term? Yes. Are we doing it? Not only are we not doing it, we're going the other direction as fast as we can because it is more short-term rewarding to those who make so much money from ignoring the environment than to think of the long-term consequences for the entire human race and the whole planet. So we humans don't have a good track record of doing the right thing. Yeah. Uh, she wanted to know, why would somebody hack my refrigerator? Uh, so they know I like asparagus. So they know I have too much of that cake <coughs> left over from the Qantas <laughs> meeting. Um, that's not what they're after. Uh, there's a thing called a bot. A bot is short from robot, and it just means an automated program a program that takes care of itself, that does what it's programmed to do and no human has to intervene with it. Well, when you're doing a major attack, uh, like a denial of service attack, a denial of service attack is preventing computers from functioning by overloading their circuits in effect. By, it's like everybody calling the same phone number at the same time and then everybody gets a busy signal. When you want to do something dastardly to someone, that's just one of the attacks you can do. In order to have all those computers sending signals all at the same time to the computer you're attacking, uh, you need an army of computers to do it. You put together an army of bots and refrigerators and televisions and all of these other appliances and appurtenances that we have now computerized can be used in that network. So when I say refrigerators, I'm thinking very specifically of an attack that used refrigerators and other home devices as part of that army of bots of thousands and thousands of computers that when it was given the signal to stand up and march, all got into gear. And what you want are nodes in the network, vast comp complex system. You want as many nodes attacking your designated node as possible. And there's no difference uh, in the system to a, a node that's in a refrigerator, or your new Ford, or your thermostat, or your garage door opener, or any of the things that they say, look at how convenient this is. You can program everything. Uh, you have a camera on your front door, so you can see who's, if the doorbell rings and you're not there, you can see who's there. So can anybody who hacks into that camera see who's there and see when you're not at home? Uh, everything, the bottom line is, everything is dual use. Everything that can be built to do something good can be used to do something bad. And uh, I haven't even gotten into biohacking. I've done more and more talks in the last five years on biohacking. Uh, because hackers now are able to use biological tools and techniques to do what I was describing at the beginning of computers. Except we're doing it with bio. We're doing it with genetic engineering. We're doing it with altering genomes. We're doing it with changing code. It's just code. It's just informational code. It just happens to be biological rather than machine. And so that's where a lot of activity has been going on for, for many, many years. And in terms of the intelligence community and what it confronts, 
uh, the people I know are more worried about that than nuclear weapons. Because a pandemic on the order of the uh, Spanish flu that would kill millions and millions of people uh, can theoretically be engineered by changing virulent flu toxins to make them ineradicable. Uh, well, that's a whole, I start to think all the things I want to say about that, and I won't. That's a whole other topic. Sir, Jimmy. He wants to know if any good can come out of hacking, and the answer is, as I said, sure. It should make us smile, it should be creative, it should be innovative, and that's where it began. Uh, hackers created all kinds of innovative solutions and applications that you use. It's, by definition, uh, the creation of innovative software that lets you do something you couldn't do before, that's hacking. And that's the history of the computer uh, industry. P uh, it's usually good hackers, hackers who want to do that, looking for solutions to problems or innovative ways to let you do things that you didn't even know uh, you wanted to do. And that's what so many of the more popular apps are for kids, uh, for young people uh, to, to download. and and participate in networks, for example, that you didn't even know you wanted to be on. Uh, my wife and I never thought we'd go on Facebook. We have seven kids scattered around the whole country. Uh, we love Facebook as a way of communicating with all our kids and grandkids. It's great. Instead of not knowing what they're doing, we know to the degree that they share it, in pictures and words, what they're up to, where they are, what's going on. Uh, so there are all kinds of beneficial things that have come from hacking. But the news media uses the word hacker to mean criminal hacker. The news media wants sensational items that it can exaggerate and distort and scare you with. Fear sells. Watch the news every night and log 20 minutes of fear, 10 minutes of feel-good stuff, where some impaired child is, is, has found his father or something. Uh, to, so you'll end with a good feeling after scaring you to death. Marshall McLuhan said long ago that that was the function of advertisements, that the news media were designed to scare you and make you anxious, and then the advertisements were to reassure you that with the right products and services, you would feel better. Uh, and, and that's, he was one of the brilliant, insightful media analysts. So yeah, it <coughs> depends on how you choose, choose to define it. But these people working on our behalf at CIA, NSA, DIA, et cetera, et cetera, 16, we have 16 named and lettered intelligence vehicles, agencies, uh, structures working right now, and there are others that aren't named. Uh, <coughs> these are hackers. They're very, very, very innovative people. And you will sometimes, uh, back in the day, I mean, if you were really good and you showed promise and you were at the right campus and and they had a professor on the payroll, and in your senior year, you'd be called in. He said, you know, I want to talk to you. Have you ever thought about a career in intelligence work? He said, no, I haven't. He says, well, you know, I think you'd be really good at that, and I, I can set up an interview, a pipeline for you to see the right people. And then, then this very smart person graduates, and, and you never hear from them again. You never hear from them again because all their work is inside in the dark world. So those are hackers, too. Everything is dual use. Good questions. Richard, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. Thanks. Yeah. Well, 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 Don't be scared. Take a look at the book, see that I'm real. Here, you want to draw?